Today we're taking steps to confront not just the gun crisis, but what is actually a public health crisis. Kiara Tate's grieving parents hung onto one another for support as they returned to the scene where their young daughter... Now police searching for two gunmen after a 15-year-old boy is shot and killed in North Carolina. They find that the tenant, they say, had a, lot a of gun. People. And in the crowd, bowing their head and crying. Really, no other option to be Big to literally get down on my hands and knees and beg my colleagues to pass laws that make this less likely. When are we gonna do something? I'm tired, I'm, I'm so tired of getting up here and offering condolences. America at gunpoint. The United States of America is hijacked by the abuse of firearms. Gun violence and mass shootings are on the rise, leaving behind a bullet-riddled American society. Yet no one has come forward to challenge the status quo. In less than half a year in 2022, there have been 233 mass shootings in the U.S., killing more than 18,000 Americans, including almost 700 kids under 18. Gun violence overtook traffic accidents in 2020 as the number one killer of American children. What's more alarming, school shootings have become more frequent and deadlier, and shooters have gotten younger. In recent years, some killers have even been minors, with the youngest been only six years old. How are minors becoming killers? And why schools and children becoming targets? Let's go back to the scene of the Texan school tragedy. He shot and killed horrifically, incomprehensibly. Those are the words of Texas Governor Greg Abbott after one of the deadliest school shootings in U.S. history. It happened in Uvalde, and it's about 80 miles west of San Antonio and 350 miles southwest of Dallas. The gunman opened fire inside Robb Elementary School around 1130 in the morning. 19 children and two teachers were gone down. Shock. Sorrow, fear. These sentiments are running high in Uvalde, Texas, after America's deadliest school shooting in almost a decade. Among the 19 children killed was Amory Jo Garza, a fourth grader who was just about to call the police when the gunman shot her. She took a picture while receiving an honor just minutes before the shooter entered the classroom. The photo with her smiling is her very last. She was hysterical saying that they shot her best friend, that they killed her best friend and she's not breathing and that she was trying to call the cops. And I asked the little girl the name and she's, <laughs> and she told me, she said, Amory, how do you look at this girl and shoot her? <laughs> Americans are no strangers to shootings, but this one has shocked the whole country. Good evening, fellow Americans. To lose a child is like having a piece of your soul ripped away. The idea that an 18-year-old kid can walk into a gun store and buy two assault weapons is just wrong. Our kids are living in fear every single time they set foot in the classroom because they think they're going to be next. Mass shootings are a consistent problem in the United States. But what's alarming is school shootings are on the rise. There have been 337 reported school shootings since 1999. Among them, 42 happened last year, a two-decade peak. So far this year, at least 24 acts of gun violence were reported on K-12 campus. Data from the New England Journal of Medicine shows that in 2020, firearm injuries have overtook auto accidents as the major cause of deaths in children. One of the children that survived mentioned just that, that they were now afraid to go to school and that that was actually um, more on their mind than their school. So that is a very big problem and it affects every child in this country. But more striking facts are how similar the patterns were shown in school shootings. 19-year-old Nicholas Cruz entered Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida and opened fire with his legally purchased AR-15. 
In less than four minutes, 14 students and three staff members were shot to death. It triggered a new round of protests against gun violence all over the states. Ten days before the Texas school shooting, a young man and avowed racist gunned down 10 black people and injured three more in a supermarket in Buffalo. And shooters of these crimes all share at least one common characteristic. They were all teenage boys. We've just seen from them two horrific crimes that we can't get out of our minds, what happened in Buffalo, what happened in a school, children in Texas. The common denominator, the weapon was an AR-15. The perpetrator was a male. And the age of the perpetrator was 18. I don't want 18 year olds to have guns. The Washington Post database shows that perpetrators behind school shootings have gotten younger. Most of them are under the age of 18. The median age is just 16. The smallest is a six-year-old boy. The brain is still evolving. It's very plastic. It doesn't remain uh, in its current state for very long, and it doesn't reach uh, an area where people can make rational decisions until much later in life. So that's why these tendencies, these shooters tend to be younger men. Uh, they tend to be impulsive. As school shootings continue across the United States, many Americans are still asking, when is something going to be done? It shot and killed him down her head and crying. This isn't a real shooting, but a safety video on what to do if one happens. For children in some states, knowing how to avoid gunshots is part of their safety education. Good. Give me three on the right. Trainings for kids like this is not unusual in Texas. Austin Shore Shots, a local shooting club, offers youth training program for girls. Some participants are first graders who are just a little taller than a shooting table. When I shoot, I think it's so much fun than playing with anything else that's in my room. In a society that places gun ownership as a constitutional right, gun culture defines life for many Americans from the cradle to the grave. From magazines, to social media, to gun fairs and shooting clubs and even more in movies and video games. Salvador Ramos, the gunman in the Uvalde, Texas Elementary School massacre, was reported to have been obsessed with a violent video game named Call of Duty. Clearly, America has a, a gun fetish. We embrace violence. Look at our movies. Look at our, our pop culture. Guns are everywhere, and they're glorified. They're, they're, they're held in higher esteem. Than, than many other things in our culture. And that's because of this notion of American rugged individualism. And this American myth is built on a lot of uh, preconceived notions and on a lot of bad information uh, that guns typically are not the solution to these types of problems. Guns cause more problems. It's accessibility. And they live in homes where guns are available. And so I think that that is what's fueling it. It's not that they're being targeted, but that guns are just so readily available. There are nearly 400 million guns in the U.S., outnumbering its population. And nearly half of American adults report having a gun in their home. Children encounter these weapons in their homes easily when they don't know how dangerous it is. This 13-year-old boy in Virginia is not old enough to buy beers, no, 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 no. cigarettes, or lottery tickets. Can I get a couple of scratch-offs? How old are you? You got your ID? 13. You what? I'm 13. You can't get no scratch on me. But he can buy a rifle from a private seller easily and legally. I'll take it. In many U.S. states, getting a gun is as easy as he does. Therefore, many people in the country are calling to lift the legal age of firearm purchases with stricter background checks. But the country's gun industry is continuing to pour millions of dollars to sponsor youth programs. A little high, but that's okay. We've got another shot for you. For gun supporters, they say there are others to blame. 
not guns. You refuse to address the real issue that if you lay a gun down, the reality is guns don't kill people. And I hate to say this, well, they do. mentally just... in unstable people kill people. And by the way, the guy that took out the gunman, thank God there was a responsible guy with a but gun. But some disagree. You know, this is about murder. People with guns kill people. The problem is inadequate mental health is just hypocrisy. Taking a look at the bigger picture. I think we have a problem of the system being broken, but the system also uh, is in need of massive overhaul if, if we're going to make any kind of progress. The problem of gun violence is burning up across the U.S. And the prevalence of gun culture in American society is pouring fuel onto the fire. A hovering systemic problem still haunts American society and triggers more gun violence. And that's hate. Hate crimes in the U.S. hit a 12-year high in 2020, as reported by the FBI. Be it racial or religious or ideological, hate kills. Hatred has long been an illness in America. Check out this Twitter post which quotes Rod Serling, creator and host of the TV series The Twilight Zone, a sickness known as hate, not a virus, not a microbe, not a germ, but a sickness nonetheless, highly contagious, deadly in its effects. And when hate meets guns, hate crimes could become even deadlier. Buffalo City, the state of New York, May 14. An 18-year-old self-identified white supremacist opened fire in a local supermarket and live-streamed his killing rampage with a helmet camera. Peyton Jandrum gunned down 13 people in a predominantly black neighborhood, leaving 10 dead and three wounded. What happened on Saturday was an act of domestic terrorism. This was an act of domestic terrorism perpetrated by a young white supremacist. In what officials believe to be his 180-page racist, hate-filled manifesto, Gendron espouses replacement theory ideas which falsely claim that non-white races are replacing whites. The Buffalo shooting reflects two of America's chronic social cancers, racial hatred and gun violence. I think in the United States, those are two separate issues, but they're linked. We do have a, a, a shocking rise in hate crimes, particularly racially motivated hate crimes in this country. And alongside of that, we have the proliferation of arms. Gun-related killings in the U.S. have been on the rise in recent years. So have been racially motivated mass shootings. Data released by the U.S. CDC shows that more Americans died of gun-related injuries in 2020 than in any other year on record. Among them, black Americans were about 12 times as likely as white Americans to be the victim of a gun murder. In recent years, the U.S. has also seen notorious racially motivated gun murders of Hispanic and Asian Americans. Hands up, hands up. In 2019, in El Paso, Texas, a shooting spree by a 21-year-old white man left 22 people dead. In his manifesto, he railed against the Hispanic invasion of Texas. Hate crimes targeting Asian Americans have also been on the rise. FBI data shows anti-Asian hate crimes increased more than 73% in 2020. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! Black Lives when the Black Lives Matter movement began in 2013, it opened the doors to another round of heated debate on race in the U.S., including systemic racism. Protesters chant their anger over the increasing number of ethnic minorities falling victim. Still, many others say institutionalized racism does not exist in America. No, I do not. And I don't believe there's systemic racism in the U.S. But some others point to the historical roots of systemic racism. This country uh, was founded 
uh, on the institution of slavery. Of course, you cannot forget about the mass genocide of the Native Americans that were here when the European settlers, air quotes here, uh, the nicest way I can put that word, uh, uh, the mass genocide of the Native Americans that were here. So, uh, you know, we really have a foundation of institutionalized racism in this country uh, against Blacks, against Hispanics, against Native Americans, and uh, to a, a slightly lesser extent against Asians that exists to this day. We see it uh, in our institutions with uh, some, our criminal justice system, how it treats Blacks and Hispanics and other minorities differently than it treats whites. We see it in our educational system uh, with different outcomes. Uh, for white children in comparison with black and Hispanic children. So we see institutionalized and systemic racism in this country to this day. Experts point to an abundance of figures as evidence the odds are stacked against minorities in the U.S., with some coming to light during the coronavirus pandemic. Ravages of pandemic have it adversely, disproportionately impacted if you are poor, and a person of color in, uh, in the United States. Black poverty as politic is a is a politically engineered condition. People of color also face legal injustices. From police to courts to prisons, African Americans often interact with a justice system they say is stacked against them. What we've seen is, you know, if you are poor and black you are not going to get, in most cases, a fair shot in this criminal justice system. From even from minor offenses, all the way up to, to more serious offenses. And when people with racial bias have easy access to guns which can be manipulated to conduct mass killing, more deadly incidents ensue. If you have unfettered access to weapons of mass destruction and weapons of war, then when you go out to perpetrate violence against uh, people or a particular community, you will be that much more efficient and that much more effective at perpetrating that violence. Uh, and of course, you will be that much more deadly. literally get down on my hands and knees and beg my Man, are we going to do something? The massacre here in Buffalo could have continued. Another shooting massacre at a supermarket in Buffalo. A 18-year-old man dressed in tactical gear and protective armor opened fire. Pushing the racist idea that white people are under threat of extinction. The mass shooting in Buffalo is seen by many as another wake-up call for the U.S. to tackle its deep-rooted racial issue. Uh, this is enough is enough, and no more uh, thoughts and prayers. It's time for actions and deeds to solve this problem. But many are pessimistic, with little faith in politicians. Get angry and justify so. The those in power don't care how angry you get. Others are blaming what they call a rotten system. I'm not just fighting police violence, I'm fighting the source of it, right? This social political economic system, which you heard me earlier, call it a low down, dirty, filthy, rotten system, and that's what it is. Analysts have also blamed national leadership for inflaming the racial hatred. Our former president, who gave a voice, gave a platform um, for this, this, this um, hatred and this um, being open with racism, his contribution was elevating the discourse of hate speech and, and racism to the point where the people who always had it before he got here now felt legitimized in expressing it publicly. And unfortunately, that still persists among current members of Congress. In terms of race, we can't kind of decouple that from the history of this nation. So President Biden actually recently um, said that hate is a stain on the soul of America. Arguably, though, historically, we can argue that it's not a stain really because the stain would have come out by now. And, and, and that's a big thing. And so we really have to reconcile with what happens in the United States if, if hate is a part of our fabric. It's a part of our being that we're never actually going to completely dismiss. To stop hate crimes, particularly racially motivated mass shootings, the U.S. has to solve the gun violence issues, too. 
In 2019, New York State passed a red flag law. It allows teachers, law enforcement, or relatives to ask the courts to temporarily block an individual from getting their hands on a firearm. But critics say the red flag laws are ineffective and infringe on the right to bear arms. It's gun confiscation without any reason to have that yet, because the person usually did not commit a crime yet. It is, um, you know, people just reporting the person and saying that they are a danger to themselves or others. What makes the gun issue more complex is that gun regulations vary from state to state. Activists also point out the need to tackle the U.S. gun industry. Well, I think that I live in a country that prioritizes guns over people. Our politicians gave their soul to the gun industry. That's a huge barrier to fight against. With. It seems there is a widening racial, economic, social, and political divide in the U.S. today. Gun violence is becoming more rampant and racially motivated mass shootings more frequent. How many more American families will have to lose their loved ones due to mass shootings? How many more tragedies like the one in Buffalo will America have to endure? American society is divided by different personal beliefs over gun control. Politicians, pro-gun interest groups, anti-gun social organizations, and the two sides of the public in general all have their own ideology toward guns and refuse to compromise. Opinion polls, government statistics, and research by institutions are all pointing to an increasingly divided states of America. December 2012. Got 911. What's the location of the emergency? Newtown, Connecticut. Sandy Hook School. I think there's somebody shooting in here. Sandy Hook School, please. 20 children and six adults killed. As a country, we have been through this too many times. And we're going to have to come together and take meaningful action to prevent more tragedies like this, regardless of the politics. Obama called for universal background checks on people wanting to buy guns and the ban on assault weapons. Each of these proposals deserves a vote in Congress. They deserve a vote. He received a standing ovation, but Speaker of the House John Boehner and some fellow Republicans stayed seated. Studies from the Pew Research Center show that more Democrats than Republicans believe gun violence is a big problem for the country and stricter laws should be passed to stop it. Since 2000, division between the two parties over how to handle gun violence has widened. A growing number of Republicans believe protecting the right to own guns is more important than controlling gun ownership. You've got a, a very rigid Republican Party and a Democratic Party that's, that's been being told by its supporters to not compromise. So there's no political middle. Um, back in the 50s and the 60s, um, when there were such things as moderate Republicans and even liberal Republicans, we don't have that anymore. Oh my God. While the two parties remain in a political standoff, the guns have not gone silent. We have an active shooter. We have an active shooter inside the warehouse. With each new shooting, the call for strict new gun legislation has risen. But I'm here on this floor to beg, to literally get down on my hands and knees and beg my colleagues. When are we going to do something? I'm tired. I'm, I'm so tired of getting up here and offering condolences to... However, gun control measures continue to fail to be passed due to strong opposition in Congress. Trying to blame Stricter laws have been blocked by many Republican lawmakers safer. whose campaigns are partially funded by the pro-gun lobby, including the National Rifle Association. This bill is a clear overreach that will predominantly punish and harass our neighbors, our friends, and our families. After the Sandy Hook shooting in 2012, Republican Senator Mitch McConnell led the charge in striking down gun control legislation. According to nonpartisan organization Open Secrets, has received $1.3 million from the NRA. And after a mass shooting in Florida in 2016, not a single bill on gun control was passed. 
Florida's Republican Senator Marco Rubio has received at least $3.3 million in NRA contributions. The NRA is still very influential, not necessarily from a campaign donor standpoint. They still hand out money a lot to, the, to, to Republicans and make sure that their voices are heard at Capitol Hill. But in terms of mobilizing voters. Another factor, experts say, has to do with the way the system is set up. U.S. states can have opposing views, but they all have shared political power, which leaves for an open-ended debate. For example, the sentiments of a small pro-gun state like Wyoming are as important as that of a larger state like California, which is pushing for less guns. And they're representing their constituents' interests, but not the interests of the nation uh, writ large. And that's a gap that, that, that is built into American politics and is next to impossible to resolve. I will never ever again. I will never have my baby again. It was a horrific tragedy. We have some death. We will need your prayers to get us through this. The familiar cycle is playing out across America. A deadly shooting, followed by grief, outrage, and fierce public debate. One side calls for reform. As a nation, we have to ask, when in God's name are we going to stand up to the gun lobby? When in God's name we do what we all know in our gut needs to be done? The other insists on more weapons. But the existence of evil in our world is not a reason to disarm law-abiding citizens who know how to use their weapon and can protect a lot of people. Why are Americans so wedded to firearms when massacres occur with such chilling frequency? Experts say the answer is twofold. Upon America successfully gaining liberation from British rule, the right to bear arms was seen as a way for citizens to protect themselves against tyrannical government rule. Hands up! Hands up! But more recently, there is a growing belief that guns are needed for personal safety. I'm at my house. I can do whatever I want with my gun. Politicians have played this up, stoking a divide and catalyzing growing differences in society. Former U.S. industry executive Ryan Bussey says the nearly $20 billion gun industry has tapped fears of crime and racial upheaval to make record sales. He says shootings like the one seen in Uvalde and Buffalo are the byproduct of a gun industry business model designed to profit from increasing hatred, fear, and conspiracy. The statistics back this up. Black low-income Americans are more likely to have been threatened by someone with a gun. It is also among the black community that fears for gun violence are highest. Majority of all non-white groups have called for stricter gun laws compared to less than half of white Americans. The right to bear arms in the U.S. is one constitutional right that is never shy of controversy or debate. In recent days, social media has been awash with the concerns of citizens across the U.S. One side asks if a child's life is less important than the right to own a firearm, whereas the other insists that removing guns would see law-abiding citizens more at risk from gun violence than they currently are already. These social media debates reflect figures that show U.S. citizens are clearly divided on gun control. And from the year 2000 to 2017, there has been a shift towards protecting ownership rights. Gun violence is just one issue that is dividing the U.S. politically and socially. It is also a tragic iteration of American exceptionalism. Politicians are calling for a choice to be made. A choice between the freedom to own a gun or the freedom to choose to live without fear. Guns should protect people rather than kill them. Schools and public places should be safe. The younger generations of Americans should live without fear of gun violence. But in reality, American people are continuously getting murdered, not just by guns, but by political divide and stalemate, institutional failures, and chronic diseases in American society. People need solutions rather than just thoughts and prayers. How many more bullets does America have to take? 
before someone finally pulls the trigger of change. Thanks for watching. I'm Xia Cheng in Beijing, and this is CGTV.